modeling, rigging, and animating tracks is not rocket science, okay? I'm about to show you how I did all three of those. And I'm not even going to waste your time with a bunch of useless information. So by the end of this video, you're going to know how to make some tracks and how to animate them on your tank so you can move around just like this. First, we have to model the sprocket. Now, uh, on the M1A1 Abrams tank, the sprocket has 11 of these cogs. Okay, if you count them, there's 11 of them. And this also means that uh, the angle between the separate cogs is exactly 32.72, 72, 72, 72, 72 degrees, right? Which means that we can only make one cog, and we can rotate it around the 3D cursor in the middle uh, after we duplicate it, and then we get 11 identical cogs on each side of the circle, right? So that's exactly what we do here. We take a vertex, and we model one side of this little uh, uh, cog here, and we just mirror it across the 3D cursor at the bottom to get it on the other side as well. Now we can adjust those a little bit, we're going to add some thickness, and then after we do that we can just add a few bevels to finish this thing off. Now once we made one, we can literally just duplicate it around the 3D cursor in the middle, and that already gives us roughly the shape that we need. Now we're just going to take some of these vertices in between, and we're going to fill in the gaps. And again, there's 11 gaps there. Now, if we fill in the faces, you can see uh, that's already more or less the shape we need, but we want to make it a little bit more detailed, so we're going to add some of these holes uh, between the cogs, right? And for that, we're just going to add a circle. We're going to rotate it into place. By the way, we have to rotate it by exactly 16.363636 degrees. And then it comes into place there. And now we, now we turn the circle into a cylinder, and then we just uh, rotate it around the circle 11 times again under the angle we used before, 32.72, 72, 72 degrees. So once we duplicate this all around the sprocket, we can literally just add a Boolean modifier, uh, apply it to the sprocket, and then once we delete the circles or the cylinders, you can see we have those nice little dents between the cogs. Now we're going to add another circle down here, uh, and we're going to try to trace the inner shape uh, with the circle, right? So we're just going to make the circle about as big as that. Uh, we're going to take half the circle and we're going to copy it to the side, and once again we're going to rotate that by 32.727272 degrees. And then we can make a little vertex in between and just pull it out towards the middle a little bit and add some bevels to make that smooth little shape between the two semicircles. Now again, if we crop this shape, we do the same thing again. We rotate it around the middle by 32.72, 72, and 72 degrees until we have the full circle. Now we separate that to a new object uh, and we stretch it out to add some thickness. And then we can just fill in the faces. Now we're also going to fill in the faces uh, uh, on the sprocket. And then we add another Boolean modifier to the sprocket, and we cut a hole using the shape we just made. It's kind of like a clove or a flower or something. So we can delete that shape, and as you can see, now we have the rim for our sprocket. Now the tracks I made here look quite kind of sophisticated, but they're really a pretty simple shape. So I have two shapes here. I have the main track pad and the little link that connects uh, the tracks, right? So together, when we multiply these using an array modifier, they kind of fall into place like this. But really, this shape is just the same as this one here. There's uh, two separate objects for the actual track, and there's three links between them. It's just basically uh, some planes which have some bevels in the corners. Now, I'm also going to run you through how I made the wheels. Basically just a circle uh, that I extruded inwards, and then I added two loop cuts uh, in this newly extruded circle. And then I just pulled out uh, the faces in the middle uh, outwards a little bit, and then I duplicate this across my 3D cursor there, so it comes to about half the track, a little bit less. And then I just bridge the edge loops between the two outer circles. So I can fill in the face in the middle in the front, I can scale it down a little and I can pull it in towards the middle. Then again I scale in the face and again I extrude it inwards. And now you can see I have this hole in the middle of the wheel. Now let's just add a few bevels. And we're also going to extrude the circle in the back inwards a little bit. And then we scale it down again and we play around with that a little bit. And we try to make it look smooth like the picture here. And once we do that, of course, we add some more bevels. And then I just made a very simple screw or a bolt in this wheel. So I add a circle, and then I add a hexagon, and then I add another circle, and then I just duplicate that and rotate it around the 3D cursor to have about 10 uh, screws. And I do the exact same thing with the other the smaller screws, which are in the outer rim here. Then I add another circle in the middle, and this is going to be the part sticking out in the middle of the wheel. I extrude the circle, I add a loop cut down the middle, and I scale down the circle that's sticking out. Another bevel in this loop cut here, and then we take the face at the end, and we extrude it inwards a little bit. And then we can just extrude that towards the middle and add another bevel there so it has a kind of hole in the nose. Now we're just going to add another circle here in the middle and we're going to extrude that out and add another bevel. So we're going to add a hexagon there and we're going to delete the face. We're going to extrude the hexagon and push it backwards a little bit. And we're going to add loop cuts on each face of the hexagon. 
Now the circle around this hexagon has exactly 30 vertices, which means if I add enough loop codes to the hexagon, uh, and it also has 30 vertices, I can just bridge the edge loops and connect them nicely. And we push this edge inwards a little bit, and you can see it's more or less the shape that I want. I'm also going to add another one of these bolts here in the middle just as a nice little touch. Then I made this little simple object, which I'm not going to explain how I did, but it's just, uh, just a plane which is kind of reshaped to get this little object here. Make sure you don't use too many vertices for this one because you're going to duplicate this about 100 million times, as you can see here. And we do the exact same thing as we did with the screws before. We just rotate it around the 3D cursor. First, we rotate it by 180 degrees, then by 90 degrees, then by 45 degrees, then by 22 and a half degrees, then by 11.25 degrees. So now we have one half of one wheel, so we're just going to mirror that and pull it backwards a little bit. And I'm also just going to add a little cylinder here in the back, so this is how the wheel is going to be attached to the suspension of the tank. And then you just duplicate these wheels uh, as many times as you need. This tank has seven wheels at the bottom and another tension wheel here at the top. And then it also has a sprocket in the back. So we place our track right there under one of these wheels. And before we do anything else, we're going to add in a path curve. And then you can just go ahead and extrude that path curve until you sort of wrap it up around your wheels and make the shape that your track should have. Now you can play, play around with this a little bit. Try to make it so that the curve is equally far from the wheels at any point. Try to make it look like there's a bit of gravity pulling the tracks. And now we're going to get to the fun part. Now you already know these are two separate objects, the track and the link. So we're going to add an array modifier to the track first. And we're going to try to adjust it so it's about as far as we want it to be. Now we're going to add another array modifier to this link in between the tracks. And we're also going to make the same distance on those so they connect uh, the tracks on every part. And let's just pump those numbers up a little bit so we have enough tracks to go all the way around uh, our path. And now we just add a curve modifier to our tracks. Uh, you can see they wrap around the curve nicely. Now we're also going to add uh, a curve modifier for the same curve to the links. And then we're going to parent the links to the tracks. That way, whenever the tracks move, uh, the links are going to follow them. But the reason the links are separate objects is because then they can have a different angle. And on the parts around the tension wheel and the sprocket, the track and the link should be pointing in different directions. So they're not going to be deformed as much by the curve. Now, if you look closely, the problem here is that the links are still clipping with the sprocket. And this is exactly what we're going to fix next. And this is going to be a little bit tricky because maybe you didn't get the measurements for your tracks and your links correctly. But that's not a huge problem because you can just play around with the curve a little bit until uh, these links and these tracks fall into place between the cogs. And now if I just add more numbers to the array modifier, uh, the tracks will wrap all the way around. And then at the very end you want to zoom in closely uh, at this part where the tracks are supposed to connect again and you want to make sure that th there's no clipping or they're not too far apart. For me they're a little bit too close, so I'm going to reduce the distance between uh, each track and the array modifier just so uh, there's no clipping there. I'm also going to do the same thing for the links and make sure that the spaces are exactly the same and then finally we can just double check that they uh, fall into place. Maybe you have to fix up your curve a little bit again. Uh, you can play around with that as much as you like, but don't worry about it too much. And now you want to make sure that all your objects here have separate names so you can recognize them in the constraints. I'm going to separately name all my wheels, like wheel 1, wheel 2, wheel 3. I'm also going to name the tracks and I'm going to name the track links. And the first step we have to do is add an empty sphere in the middle. And we're going to use the sphere together with some constraints to make it so that when the sphere rotates, the tracks are going to move in the appropriate direction. So we're going to select the tracks and we're going to go to our constraints tab and we're going to add a transformation constraint. Now you have to make sure that your target is on world space and your owner is on local space. And you also want to check the extrapolate box. Now I'm going to rename my sphere just so I can find it in this menu here. And then go back to your track and for target, select the sphere. Now we're going to open map from and you're going to set that to rotation. And then when you go to map 2, you're going to set that one to location. When the sphere rotates, the tracks follow this rotation, but instead of rotating, they move their location based on this rotation. Now for this case, we're going to go to our map from and we're going to set the y max to 1 degree. Now we're going to set our y source axis to x, and we're going to set the x maximum to minus 11 meters. And now you can see when we rotate the sphere around the x axis, the track moves along in the same direction. Now that works fine, but the problem is this is still clipping through our sprocket because the sprocket is not turning well. So in order to fix this, we're going to do the exact same thing with the sprocket. We're going to make it so that when the track moves, the sprocket rotates along with it. So we're going to add another transformation constraint to our sprocket, and we're going to select our sphere. Now again, set the owner to local space, and check the extrapolate box. Now in this case, we're going to map from rotation, and we're going to map to rotation. So in the map from rotation, we're going to set x maximum to 1 degree. And then we're going to set the x maximum to something like 561 degrees. 
Now, if we try this now, you can see that the sprocket turns when we rotate the sphere, but it doesn't really match with how the tracks are turning. You can see that if we rotate the sphere a little bit, the tracks move a lot, but the sprocket kind of turns very slowly. And then the track kind of catches up with the cog and then it clips through. So to fix that, we can just increase the angle that we have there. In my case, I have to make it more negative, so I'm going to play around with the number until I get the right turning ratio. Now, you can never be 100% accurate with this because there's always going to be a slight difference, but I usually try to test it out by rotating the sphere by something like 3,600 degrees. And that way I can tell, okay, if after 10 full rotations, there's no clipping between the track and the sprocket, I can be pretty sure that uh, the, the tracks are not really going to clip through the sprocket. So what are we going to do about the wheels? Well, we're going to do literally the exact same thing. Now you can sort of copy the constraints of other objects so that one object has the exact same constraint settings as the other one without you having to go through all the trouble of setting up the axes and the numbers and the angles and everything like that. And the way to do that is you select the object to which you want to apply the same constraint and then after that you select the object which already has the constraint that you want to copy to the other object. And now with those two selected, you go to the object menu, you go to constraints and you select copy constraints to selected objects. Now we're going to copy the constraint from the sprocket to the wheel, but the wheel doesn't have the same turning ratio as the sprocket. As a matter of fact, they turn a little bit slower. So I'm going to set the maximum angle there to about minus 705 degrees. That's what I figured works for me. You can try to play around and see what works for you, but it's probably going to be something somewhat close to that. And now once we apply that to one wheel, we're going to select all the other wheels, and we're going to select the wheel that we already applied this constraint to, and we're just going to do the same thing. We're going to go to Objects, Constraints, and copy the constraint data to the other wheels. And now when we rotate the sphere, you can see all the wheels are moving in unity. Now we're going to attach this rig to the rest of our tank. And we're going to make it so that when the tank moves, the tracks move as well. So first of all, we're going to select our tracks and we're going to parent those to the curve. Then we're going to select the wheels, the sprocket, and the sphere, and we're going to also parent that to the curve. And this is when you move the curve around, the whole rig moves along with it. And then we're going to add another empty, and this time we're going to add a cube. Now we're going to clear the parent from the sphere and we're going to parent that to the cube instead. And then we're going to parent our cube to our curve. So let's bring our tank down here and attach the tracks of the tank. And it's very important that you make sure that your curve is parented to the body of the tank. And then we're going to add a transformation constraint to our sphere again. And in that constraint we're going to target the hull of the tank. And now set the owner to local space. And this time we're going to map from location to rotation. We're going to set our Y maximum to about 10.9. And our X source maximum is going to be 1 degree. And now when we move the tank along the y-axis, you can see that the tracks rotate as well. The problem, however, is when you rotate the tank, the tracks are not moving at all. Now this doesn't make any sense. The tank can't just rotate on its own. The tracks need to rotate in different directions in order for the tank to turn, right? So when the tank turns to the right, the track on the left side is going to turn forwards, and the track on the right side is going to turn backwards. And so we can do the same thing using constraints. We can make it so that the tracks move also based on the rotation of the tank. So we're going to select our cube and we're going to add a transformation constraint and this time we're going to target the curve. Now again check the extrapolate box and set the owner to local space and we want to map this from rotation to rotation again. Now this time we're going to set a Z minimum in the map from box and we're going to set that to something like minus 56 degrees and we're going to set our X source axis to Z and on that we're going to set the maximum to 1 degree. Now when we turn the tank you can see that the tracks move as well. So now if I select my entire rig, and that includes the tracks, the links, the wheels, the sprockets, the little tension wheels, everything, as well as the empty sphere and the cube, I can place my 3D cursor in the middle and I can just duplicate this and mirror it across the 3D cursor. Now you want to make sure you flip the normals after you do something like this. So with everything selected, I'm going to go to edit mode and I'm going to sh uh, press shift N to recalculate the normals. So now finally when we rotate the tank, both the tracks are actually moving and it looks like the tank is really moving. Now if you look closely on the tracks that I just duplicated, it seems like they're turning in the wrong direction when we rotate a tank. They're both moving forwards and they shouldn't. One of the tracks should be moving backwards. So to fix that, we're just going to select the cube and we're going to go over to our constraint. And in the map from box, we're going to go to our Z minimum and we're going to change it from minus 56 degrees to positive 56 degrees. And that way it just rotates in the other direction based on the rotation of the tank. And that's exactly what we need now. It's moving in the other direction when we turn the tank and it looks realistic. Now the only thing that still bothers me is that the tracks are moving a little bit too quickly when we rotate the tank. And to fix that we're just going to increase the angle in the constraint. Now you want to make the negative angle more negative and the positive angle more positive. It seems a little bit counterintuitive because you might think if you reduce the angle it's going to move more slowly, but no. What this means is the tank has to rotate more in order to move the tracks by a certain unit. Now before the tank had to rotate 
by 56 degrees to move the tracks by a certain distance. Now the tank has to rotate something like 80 degrees in order to move the tracks a certain distance. Now the tracks move more slowly in relation to the rotation of the tank. And now your tank is ready to go.